Well, remember, you're going to have two candidates at a time, okay. two deacons. Yeah, so I'm going to do the elders first and then the deacons so that the new elders can pray over the deacons. Okay. I'd like to invite you to open your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a, desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing in the great assurance in their faith and in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible word that we have as a guide of faith and practice in the church. Lord, be with us as we continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that though we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that by your grace and through the blood of Jesus Christ and faith in him and his finished work on Calvary, we may have forgiveness of sins and we may have the promise of eternal life. Father, you've set aside leaders in the church uh, to help and to provide structure and guidance and direction. And Father, today as we come together to ordain four men into the ministry to his deacons and to his elders, we pray, Father, that though we fall short of your glory, you may cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that you may also guide us in a way that we become more and more like Jesus as we follow his pattern. In his name I pray, amen. In just a few minutes, we're going to be asking four men to come and forward and be ordained into the ministry of Christ. Two have been called to be deacons, to imitate Christ as servants to the Lord's body, to the church. And two have been called as elders to lead, care for, and shepherd the flock of Christ in this place. Now these servant leaders have specific areas of ministry in the church that they will be responsible for. Uh, leading up to this moment, there was a process that began with a close examination of the biblical qualifications for these servant leaders. The scriptures themselves are infallible. We, on the other hand, are not. So those tasked with examining the candidates prayed extensively for God's guidance in this matter and then placed these men before you for a vote of confidence. 
of which the majority voted in the affirmative. As I watched this process unfold, as I have many times in the past and in other churches, I had one question. Why would anybody want to be a leader? I mean, think about it. Why would anybody want to put themselves through such scrutiny and examination of their lives? Why would anybody want to do that? Now, it's true, God's Word calls all of us to examine ourselves. For example, before we partake of the Lord's Supper, I know that you're in the habit of looking over your life, looking over the past week, looking over the, maybe as you think about the week of head, ahead, and you ask God to forgive you where you've fallen short of His glory throughout the week, and you ask Him for strength for a, a new day and a new week. And isn't that a wonderful time of communion between you and the Lord? The Word of God also calls us to examine ourselves at other times. For example, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the Bible says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So there's this constant evaluation, self-evaluation, as you're guided by the Holy Spirit to ensure that you are, in fact, in the faith and following Christ. Even in the Old Testament, for example, in Lamentations 3 and verse 40, the Bible says, let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Galatians 6, 3 says this very simply, let each one test his own work. And so there's this process of self-examination for every Christian. It's done in private, and it's done as you commune with the Lord. But you know what? Who's involved in that is God's doing some examining of His own, isn't He? In fact, in Psalm 139, the Bible says, O Lord, You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, and You know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. So in this process of self-examination, we have God looking into our lives. That ought to be humbling uh, to you and it ought to be humbling to me as well. And so self-examination is critical for the life of a Christian. Looking into your own life is important. Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's difficult. But what about opening yourselves to the scrutiny of others? And that's precisely what the Word of God calls for in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Every leader, when he answers God's call to leadership, opens his life up for others to take a look. And you know what? We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, but thank God for His grace and His mercy and His kindness and His love and affection towards us that even though we are sinners, He sent His Son to die on a cross for us and to give us a new way to live. But you know, the scrutiny doesn't stop once you become a leader after the initial examination of the current leaders and the congregation. Once you become a leader, the examination continues. Always, constantly. People are looking at your life and they... They have ideas about that. Every decision made by a leader affects someone, and not everyone will fully understand the reasons behind the decisions that leaders make. A lot of times, decisions that are made are clouded because you don't know all the details. And you know what? Some of the details are private matters that can't be discussed publicly. And so when the decision makes a leader, after he weighs all of the circumstances and all of the things that are involved in making that decision, some of the things can't be revealed. And so he himself is under scrutiny for his decision, and the decisions that he makes aren't always popular. But we trust 
that our leaders are being guided by God in the Word and the Holy Spirit so that when, we make, when they make those decisions, we can rally behind them in encouragement and support and prayer and lift them up just like Moses' arms were lifted up by his servants so long ago. And as we lift them up, they'll be able to continue to lead the church the way God would have them to lead it. You know, a lot of times leaders uh, are blindsided by landmines and pitfalls and so not so friendly fire sometimes. It's a difficult, difficult position to be in, to be a leader in any organization, but particularly when we're dealing with such weighty matters as the eternal salvation of individuals. Uh, it's a very, very lofty and heavy responsibility. Uh, it, it reminded me, I haven't seen the movie, uh, but I are, understand it's already getting some Oscar nods. It's the movie 1917. Have you heard about it? It's about World War I. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's about World War I and trench warfare. Now you want to talk about a grueling experience. They had trenches. There was frontline trenches, there were support line trenches, and there were some back communication trenches. But in between the trenches uh, of the Allied forces and the German forces, there was this area called no man's land. And in this particular storyline that's based on some true uh, occurrences that happened in World War I, in this storyline, there is a... A, an operation that's going to attack the Germans. But what these 1,600 troops don't know is that the German positioning of their troops has changed, and what they're doing is they're walking into a trap. And 1,600 men were un, in danger of being killed. And so the leaders decide to send out two runners. Now, you got to think about this no man's land and you got to think about what it entails and what's in this no man's land that makes it so dangerous. And here's what it is. In no man's land, there are, are dead soldiers. There's dead animals, horses. There's, there's blown up pieces of bombs with the shards and all of the sharp edges and and then there's barbed wire. In addition to those physical things that are in no man's land, there's this constant uh, poisonous gas that's being shot out there. There's machine gun fire that's happening. And then there's also snipers just waiting for someone to step out into no man's land so that they can pick them off. You know, it's interesting in addition to that, they always send them out. If they have to send someone out, and it's usually under most, the most dire circumstances that they send these runners to carry a message. Because these two men, these two corporals, Corporal Blake and Corporal Schofield, as they're so named in the movie, are supposed to carry this dire message to those 1,600 troops so that they do not attack the Germans and only fall into this trap. And so it's the only way to get the message is to send these two runners. There's no other way to communicate to them because they're behind enemy lines. And so they send these two runners. And the reason they send two is in case one of them gets shot, the other one can pick up the message and, and keep running. The journey was so perilous that the order was only given under the most crucial circumstances. Now, I know that comparing church leadership <laughs> to World War I might be a stretch, but is it? Aren't we under constant fire? Aren't we, isn't the devil ready to pick us off and knock us down and cause our ways to stumble as leaders in the church? You bet he is. In fact, the Bible says our enemy is Satan and his legion of demons. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Being a Christian leader is dangerous business. But what Paul says is that a lot of times what happens is we get it all mixed up. We look at the decisions sometimes leaders make. We look at what's happening in the church and all of a sudden we want to blame somebody for something that's going in a direction that we just don't like. And we begin to attack people. And Paul says that our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is Satan and the demons and the powers and the dark forces behind the enemy lines that are trying to attack us and destroy us and pull us down. And as a church, what we do to combat that is we are, have a harmonious fellowship where we understand that sometimes difficult decisions need to be made. But at the same time, we lift up our leaders through prayer and through encouragement, and we are grateful to them for standing in the gap, for carrying the message that is so crucial to the lives of of so many and not only temporary lives on earth but eternal lives for all time with all the scrutiny with all the potential perils why would anyone want to be a leader and the answer is this because the message we carry is so crucial for the survival of the hearers Christian leaders do not bring glory to themselves. They are attempting to bring glory to Christ and life to the perishing. Leaders run the gauntlet because the work is just that important. And so today, when God has a special work, He calls special people to stand in the gap and to take the message, and to run, and to face the perils that are going to be there, and to open yourself up to scrutiny, and to realize that what you're about to do as leaders is so vitally important that people's eternal lives hang in the balance. You know, the Holy Spirit, as it guided the early church, recognized how important the work of deacons and elders are and so we have some examples in acts chapter 6 here's what the bible says as we look at the example of the first deacons that were to come about acts chapter 6 now at this time while the disciples were increasing in number a complaint arose on the part of the hellenistic jews against the native hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parnaeus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. It goes on to say that the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. So what we see is men standing in the gap, being called to servant leadership in the church, and because of their efforts, the apostles and the evangelists were able to spread the word of God, and the church continued to grow. A vital, vital role in the church. Later, as the church spread throughout the Mediterranean world, Paul and Barnabas journeyed to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. 
The Apostle Paul knew that there, these new converts needed someone to shepherd them and guard them from falling away. What an important job. So Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in every church having prayed with fasting. And they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Paul charged the elders of the church at Ephesus to be on guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And so today, Calvin, Tootie, Gover, and Scott Hall are being called to this position. And I would like those two men to come forward at this time. After this public examination, I'm going to ask them, those who are going to pray for them, to come forward. And it would be the reigning elders of this time. So first, I'm going to ask the congregation this question. As we consider our harmonious effort in, through prayer and encouragement to lift these leaders up. Congregation, have you as a church considered seriously the decision to accept Tutti Gover and Scott Hall to serve as elders of Draper Christian Church? If so, answer, we have. Tutti and Scott, you desire to be set apart as an elder in the church. If so, answer, I do. Will you be faithful to God's word? If so, answer, I will. Will you faithfully serve Christ by spreading, by shepherding the members of this congregation? If so, answer, I will. And this time, I'd like those who are going to pray over these men to come forward now and have a prayer for them. Go ahead. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special opportunity we have in our worship service today to bring before you Scott and Tootie and elders and work at Christian Church, and I just pray, God, you'll be with these men and, and be with the congregation as we grow together in your love and service and, and doing your will. Give these men the courage and the wisdom and strength um, to go forward, dear God, for you. Thank you for their desire to be a, a leader here at Draper Christian, and I know with that desire, that desire means that they're wanting to carry the message of Christ to others. They were wanting to do your will, dear God, in, in your life and helping the congregation in that way. Thank you for your son Jesus who made this possible. And I pray in his name. Father, thank you so much for these men and for their desire uh, to step in the gap, to lead this congregation. And we pray, Father, that uh, they will begin this journey and grow into this position as they continue to study your word and as they continue uh, to set aside time for study and prayer and as they lift up this congregation in their private time they lead them by example in the community and through the uh, their ability to share the gospel with so many i pray uh, that you would fill them with strength of the holy spirit as you guide them in this, in this new endeavor as elders of Draper Christian Church. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Tootie, I want you to sit right here. And if you would just sit there, and if you'll just back right up, I'm going to call the other two men up. And you guys are going to pray for them when they're done. Elders are charged with guiding and teaching Deacons minister in the areas of compassion and benevolence. As each performs his ministry, the church will become more and more Christ-like. Others will be drawn into the fellowship, 
and the influence of the gospel will multiply. Today, we come together to ordain Michael Haskins and Phil Pruitt to the position of deacon. And I'd like these two men, if they would come and stand before me today. First, I'd like to address the congregation. Have you, as a church, considered seriously the decision to accept Michael Haskins and Phil Pruitt to serve as deacons of Draper Christian Church? If so, answer, we have. Yes. Michael and Phil, do you desire to be set apart as a deacon in this church? If so, answer, I do. Will you be faithful to God's word? If so, answer, I will. Will you faithfully serve Christ by serving the members of this congregation? If so, answer, I will. I'll turn and face their congregation now, and at this time I'd like the elders to lay hands on these two new deacons. And at the same time that these men are being prayed for, we want to also remember the existing deacons that we have uh, as we lift not only these two men up, but the entire deacon body. God, our Father, we thank you for loving us and caring for us. Thank you for Phil's life and Mike's life and their desire for us and to serve this church and serve us. And I just pray, God, you pour your blessings out upon them and help them, help the congregation and help us, God, to be able to do what we have. Thank you. Thank you. 